I want to go ahead and, and uh, uh, introduce myself. I'm Eric. That's a picture of me. Hopefully everybody can see that. I work at TI. I'm a science and STEM manager, uh, former teacher. Uh, I was a high school science teacher in Fort Lauderdale, Florida many, many years ago. Um, and then tonight, your panelists are going to be Fred Foch. Um, Fred is a TI employee. He, he's our STEM education manager. He's a former Science Olympiad coach and science teacher. He's got almost 30 years of uh, educational experience. Uh, Fred, are you on? I am, Eric. All right. All right. Thanks, Fred. And then our other panelist is Mike Smith. Uh, Mike is a veteran science teacher. He's also a national and state level Science Olympiad event supervisor. And he is a national T-Cube instructor um, with decades of educational technology experience. And that's not to say Mike is old. Uh, it's just that he, he just has a lot of experience. He started teaching when he was about eight or nine years old. Uh, so Mike, are you on? Yes, I am, Eric. Awesome. Okay. All right. And then, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, for any any uh, questions that you have, use the Q and A box. Uh, the Q and A box. You should be able to find that on the one of the side panels. It'll say um, it'll say Q and A, uh, or you can use the chat box. Um, the chat box icon should be at the bottom of your screen. There's a little. Uh, it's like a little uh, dot on the bottom of the screen with a little thought bubble. Um, so either one of those will work and um, and answer any question right now, actually. Um, so so uh, please let me know if you have any questions. I apologize if I don't get right back to you. Uh, just, you know, uh, be patient and I'll, I will uh, do my best. Uh, for the agenda tonight, I was hoping that um, uh, Fred Foch could go over that with us tonight. Fred? Yeah, thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, I appreciate you having me tonight. Thanks for everybody that's out there uh, weighing in on all of this. And uh, uh, any students, I hope, hope you good luck this year. So uh, our agenda for tonight then is to uh, is using the TI Inspire CX. In the webinar, participants will learn useful and important things to look out for in preparing students for the Division C detector building event. Uh, some of the things that we're going to discuss are the rules clarification and common questions, which microcontroller devices can be used. Uh, and if you need any help coding, we can hopefully get you some help. Uh, how can a TI calculator be used? Uh, thermistors versus analog temperature sensors and, and where to find help. And then we're gonna have a little uh, follow up at the end. So Eric. Hey, thanks Fred, um, let's see. Uh, the next slide is going over uh, just some detector building resources. Uh, if you guys go to www.tidetectorbuilding.com, um, you should be able to find quite a few resources on how to, how to um, learn the skills necessary to be successful. Uh, we don't necessarily give you any uh, answers um, as far as exactly how to build uh, the sensor. But we do provide you with um, loaner calculators, loaner uh, microcontrollers. We'll send you a free detector building kit. There's a bunch of other stuff that uh, that we'll do um, for you as well. Uh, you'll have access to the TI STEM team um, uh, for any questions that you might have. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Mike, are you there? I am here. All right, Mike, do you want me to pass the... Uh, the presentation to you. Okay, let me. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to pass it on to Mike. Mike's going to be your presenter from here. And then Mike, uh, if you want to go over your uh, your PowerPoint, just remember to uh, to share uh, your screen. And it may take a few seconds to um, to catch up. And all this technology confuses me. <laughs> I'm doing the event, right? Yeah. Okay. Am I up and live? Eric? Yeah, Mike, are you there? Yeah, can you see me? Yep, sure can. It says main goals. There you go. All right, so I've um, been involved with this project for about two years now. 
uh, was overrunning uh, the trial event in several states prior to the year it became official. And uh, in the process of running these workshops, I find that certain main points become the issue every time I do a workshop. Uh, so far this year, I've ran five different state workshops for coaches. I think Fred's going to be running a couple. Uh, we're actually running some uh, this upcoming month in uh, Michigan and Indiana for coaches and for um, participants, team members. And so this is some of the points. So when we look at the actual event, there are certain goals that you have to focus on. And I'd rather not get bogged down on all the details, but actually look at the big picture. And as Eric said, I've been a science teacher for 41 years, and I guess STEM was something that I always enjoyed because it makes science real. And I was doing a lot of these projects before it was ever, uh, it was even given a name, I think. But the first thing on this whole project is, is that the student has to build a device, a probe, that's going to uh, detect some real world environment and then be able to um, dis display this information in a way that's meaningful to the user. Um, we picked temperature this year, and in, in future years there'll be other things that we measure, but this year we, we are measuring a temperature device. And so uh, it starts with some suggestions on how to do it, but really we do expect the student to do some research on their own and, and look at some science and try to figure out what kind of uh, device or what type of uh, sensor could be made that would change values based on temperature changes. I, I used to compare it to like, I'm sure some time in history, somebody observed that maybe mercury or other liquids expanded um, upon temperature change and that they thought that maybe they could use that expanding volume as, as an indication of temperature. But what we're doing is the same type of thing with electronics, looking for something that varied as temperature varied. The next part they had to do with that mercury thermometer is once they put it into a column, they had to make it useful by calibrating it, put some marks on there and, and say that this is what it means when it reaches to this level, it meant this particular temperature. So calibration becomes a big part of this project. You have a sensor, it's uh, changing some type of electronic value, whether it's voltage or uh, resistance, and it's uh, translating that into a meaningless number that we have to turn into a meaningful number. And we decided this year to use degrees Celsius, so you're gonna to have to figure out how to calibrate. And about every piece of science equipment I've ever used, when you get a box, you really need to calibrate it because all equipment can have um, discrepancies. I keep kidding my wife, I wish she would calibrate our bathroom scale because I know it's off by about 20 pounds and I know she, she does that deliberately, so be it. Once you get the calibration and you see a pattern, then that needs to be built into a code so that the, the microprocessor that you're using takes these analog readings and turns it into a meaning that does it automatically. So what it displays now is meaningful information. Uh, so you're building a probe. Uh, you're not buying one from a store. You're not buying one from Amazon. You're, you're building a probe, then you're calibrating your probe, and that calibration is something that you need to do. Uh, you're not using an equation that was given to you by a manufacturer who said that this is the one to use. You're actually showing the data and how it supports that conversion, and then you're building all this into your, your program so that you can produce results that make some sense. Then for fun, uh, we went one farther step. We said, okay, let's do a visual of this temperature range. So we will have uh, four different temperature ranges and this uh, will be indicated by LEDs. Uh, I think we designated as red, green, and blue. And the temperature ranges will be continuous, but we will not tell you those ranges till you actually enter the room because I wanna know that the person is doing the coding and it didn't come in from somebody outside that room. And so we'll tell them the numbers and then they'll change their code. So maybe it'll be blue from, I don't know, zero to 25 degrees, and then from 25 to 40, it might be green. And, and so we're gonna have different temperature zones, and that will be based on their uh, event supervisor, and they'll put that on a board, post it before you come in. At the state level, it's gonna get a little bit more interesting because we may have combinations. We may say, hey, give me a red and blue at this range and a green and red at that range, so we may have 
multiple LEDs coming on uh, rather than a single LED. But at the regional level, there will only be a single. And then finally, we'll have a journal that documents all this. And in the rules, it's laid out pretty specific what is looked for in that journal. And that journal will be graded uh, by the event supervisor or someone that he designates as the, the grader. And it will be looking for you to uh, explain your, your device itself, your probe, how you build it. Uh, it will be looking at the code. It will be looking for your data. It will be looking for the incorporation of your conversion equation into your code. Also be looking for your code where your LEDs are being signaled. And uh, each of these things will be worth points. And uh, you've got about, depending on the uh, competition, around 15 minutes from start to stop to um, pull off the event. And um, we've had a lot of fun with it. It's just been something the kids have really enjoyed. The big difference that we did this year over the uh, trial events is at the regional level, we're going to allow the team member, or actually we're going to require the team member to bring the thermometer in that they um, use to calibrate their probe. They will supply that thermometer and it's got to be digital and it's got to be to the nearest degree uh, to the event supervisor. And when they come up to determine the temperatures uh, of the four stations, they will be uh, judged against that particular thermometer. So they will not have time during their competition to recalibrate their device. The only thing they'll be doing prior to competition will be changing the LED ranges. But then at the state and the national level, we're going to go ahead and, and we'll supply the thermometer. So we've added a degree of difficulty where now you have to adjust your calibration to the thermometer we're using. And there'll be accurate laboratory thermometers, but every thermometer is slightly different. Therefore, it's going to take some adjustments to your code before you're actually ready to calibrate, but this still will be done within a 15-minute block if that's a normal rotation. The website that Eric is referred to is the prime resource. On most of my workshops I'm doing, I will now go to this, this website and that has all the resources you need for the coding using the TI Innovator. Uh, and let me say a couple words about that. One of the things I try to stress at the workshops is that this is not necessarily a TI event where you have to use the innovator or other microprocessors. But what people are finding out when I run these workshops is that the, this particular uh, microprocessor is so incredibly easy to program in comparison and that this particular resource is so full with about everything you need to know and it's written in such a way that your student can sit down and teach themselves. It's not something that the event supervisor or the coach has to do. Uh, it's just, it, it's rich. It's got a lot of tutorials. It will take you all the way. I'm currently using it with my eighth grade students, and they are very successful with this. And, and in this particular project it only takes them a short amount of time to learn how to do it. And it's something that I recommend highly for you to go to. Uh, and again, if there's a video there, there's hard copies. There's uh, just a lot of resource. Rick, I'll give it back to you. Uh, say, Mike. Yes, sir. So uh, did you start out as an expert uh, in all of this coding? Uh, did you do this in your science classroom uh, all along? Or? Yeah, the true story is, um, no, I started out on the slide rule. Computers scared me to death when I first went to college. Um, for the first few years of teaching, I would not use calculators. I would use computers. Um, when I started teaching at my present school, they uh, dropped a eighth grade group on me, uh, kind of a surprise, and said I had them for half a year, and they wanted me to do something with them. I had never coded before. Uh, I knew TI had this equipment. I was comfortable with the TI calculators. So I said, well, let me try it. So I started out with eighth graders and innovators, and I went to that website, and we just followed the units and the lessons and, and had a great time. It was one of the greatest fearful classes I had, but it turned out to be one of my favorite classes now. Hmm. 
So what were some of the resources you used to, um, to learn how to do it yourself? Well, the, the, when you go to the website, and I hope we'll bring it up in a little bit, or, there's a 10 minutes of code, and there's units, and there's a 10 minutes of code for the Inspire or the uh, 84 plus CE unit. You can pick either platform to work from. When you go there, there are tutorials. So typically there are a unit, and in the, in the unit there are three skill uh, lessons. And at the end of the skill lesson, there's an application. And the skill will take you almost in a cookbook manner, uh, blow by blow, telling you how to maybe do an if loop or uh, this thing rather or a while loop. And then the application, after you've learned three skills, will then say, okay, now let's take that in a more creative way. So it's not as cookbook, but now the student uh, applies those things they learned in the skill. Then you go to the next unit and you go through the same thing, three skills and an application. And so we worked our way through the skills, learning how to write basic programs and getting the calculator to do various things. And then the next group of tutorials was called 10 Minutes of Coding for the Innovator, the TI Innovator. And now it's taking those calculator skills that you've learned and putting it into a practice by using the Innovator. And I guess the thing that I really enjoyed about the Innovator is that it has certain built-in uh, functions beyond the microprocessor. So it's got a built-in red LED, it's got a built-in RGB, it's got a built-in speaker, it's got a built-in light sensor. And because of that, you don't have to add additional things. The innovator does it all. And so you follow the lessons, hook it to your calculator, you don't need a computer. And the calculator uh, then runs the innovator and you can make a light show, you can make a simulate a night light so you have an input a loop um, you can do fun things play songs with it uh, the kids have a riot uh, doing each other with different songs and so when you finish again a unit that has skills and then an application and it takes you all the way through to the point that now you're comfortable with the hub and you're comfortable with the calculator at that point ti has got other resources are the ones that I like were called Pathways to STEM. And the Pathways to STEM is where we got little bits and pieces that made this project. So there's six uh, different projects, or six different projects. Each one has a skill. And each skill has a project that follows that skill. So you learn a skill and there's a lot of learning about the electronics, about the components that you're working with, and you just follow it. And then your imagination takes over as you start seeing the things you can do. You start wondering, oh, gee, could I hook this with that? So um, if you go back to where you were just now, okay, so this gives you going down a little bit farther. Go down to the pathways to STEM, and then we can come back up. But these are what I'm talking about. There's six of them. These four are the ones that have components that are very useful for this detector building project. And it is not a cookbook on how to do the detector building, but it has snippets in each one that are essential for the whole project to work, and it's a great learning experience. So that's where I got my resources. I simply went here and said, hey, here's how we can make an LED work, or here's how we can make a sensor in, here's how we can uh, calibrate it, and here's how we can do a, a feedback loop so we can let the sensor control the LEDs, and it just went from there. Same, Mike. Um, it, it, if I could hop in here, I'll kind of describe these in a little bit better detail. Of, yep. um, yeah, the, the first one uh, that you see uh, where it's listed under building an LED breadboard, uh, that one actually is called uh, setting digital output. And there's a skill builder that teaches students about digital output on microcontrollers. And so this is a fairly um, general overview of how to use the microcontroller to turn on an LED, how to turn off an LED, and that sort of thing. Um, the, the next one um, is getting analog input. This, this part uh, actually talks about how to use the analog to digital converter on the microcontroller. That's the pin that actually reads voltage, and how to make sense of it, how to turn that analog input into a voltage, a, a step that's necessary for the competition, to be able to take an 
analog input and, and display voltage on your computer or calculator. The next one, calibrating a sensor, uh, describes how to associate that analog input from the previous lesson and turn it into a meaningful output related to whatever physical phenomenon is being observed. And so the calibration um, uh, one specifically addresses how to um, associate uh, an analog input with something like a centigrade temperature. Uh, and then the last one, uh, which is um, uh, feedback and control, is a uh, activity where, or a lesson actually, where students learn how to take an input, make a decision regarding that input, and then set an output. And so feedback and control is at the heart of most electronics engineering projects, whether it's the cruise control on your car or the touch screen on your phone, dialing tones that uh, make the, the phone work. So feedback and control is a big um, component to all of this as well. So there are six units to the Path to STEM projects. This uses four of them. And uh, as uh, Mike said, this is, these are not specifically for the, the competition. Uh, in terms of, you know, telling you how to do it. But what they are are act lessons that a person can use and, and, and participate in to learn the, the, the real background and knowledge needed to do the competition. So, um, so these are the resources that a person would do to, to kind of get it all figured out. I think what um, has been pulled up on the screen now is actually one of the activities. Uh, so this is a uh, student activity on, on calibration. Um, there's actually another one, a, a skill builder that goes with this um, that uh, uh, would probably be the first step. There are, there's a skill builder and a project for each one of these. And uh, so typically you do the skill builder first, then the project. We've, the ones that are relevant are kind of highlighted for you on the website. But there's a lot of other information associated, particularly in the skill builders, to help you with that. So, did, so Fred, my for a second? The documents that you used. Fred, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, can we go scroll back up to the top? Sure. Okay, so on the competition, there's also a written test, and the written test consists of questions that deal with. Uh, the student's knowledge of, of uh, the devices that you're using and some of the skills that you're using to do the device. Every one of these four that uh, Fred has been talking about has a background section, and that background section gives you a lot of information that's a great starting point for your students to gain background on the, the things that could be asked on that uh, written test. So I strongly recommend that you go there, read it, and you know maybe not just stop there, this gives you the starting point. Then go ahead and scroll down a little. Okay. Where we get into the, keep going. All right, so now you've got some materials. Now one of the things that I found out the hard way, these are great materials to use for this particular project. But you want to be a little bit more creative when you actually build your device for the competition. So I'm not suggesting in any way that um, the stuff that they use to make their particular sensor is the end product. I would definitely have your student do some work as they construct a waterproof uh, probe that is, has the ability to withstand temperatures from uh, ice water to hot water and, and, and not stop with the first attempt. So that, that list kind of worried me a little when I saw, but it's it's great for this event, but you need to go farther for the detector event. And then right there is the part I really love. So right now you've got the ability to see how to wire this sensor up, gives you an end view of the, of, the, of the sensor and then the wiring, and it tells you how to do it. And in some of the handouts, they'll be giving you schematics and you'll, you'll be able to see all that. So there's a lot of learning that's gonna go on with this, uh, again, and as you can see, it tells you step by step what to do. And, it, and they're just good. They're well written, and uh, my kids enjoy it. And there's where your calibration is going. So, you know, what temperature produces what analog value? They come up with a linear fit, and, and it's required that you have at least 
10 data points. So don't just do zero and 100. You're going to be doing a minimum of 10 and come up with your relationship and then look for your equation. In this case, it's linear, not, not necessarily in every case. Um, and then that's going to be building your code. So it's a great handout. Yeah, uh, this is Eric, and uh, yeah, Mike, I, I, I think, um, I, I think that's that's a really good point. So, so not only are you guys gonna gonna have this material available to you, and by the way, everything on that website is free. So, um, you know, for those of you that ha are are scared to death of this this particular competition because it requires some some level of knowledge of coding and a little bit of engineering. Um, fear not, we're here to help. And so if you go to the TIDetectorBuilding.com website, you can uh, request uh, a loaner um, hub and a loaner calculator. And those loans are good for about a month and that'll give you enough time to find out if that's something you wanna invest in or maybe your school already has access to. Um, and we're also gonna, while supplies last, we're giving out a detector building kit. And I'm gonna jump over to the website real quick to show you what that looks like. It's not much to it. Uh, it's this, and um, there are the wires that you will need, the LEDs, the little uh, TI LM19 analog temperature sensor, uh, resistors that are necessary, the breadboard. We're just gonna give that to you, okay? We're, you keep it, it's yours forever. Uh, now, we're only doing one per team per school, and like I said, while supplies last, but uh, feel free to take advantage of this program. We want to try to outfit you with, uh, um, you know, enough material to be successful. Uh, I'm going to blow up one of these pictures here um, so you can kind of see what, what we're talking about, and Fred and Mike jump in here if, um, if, you, if you want. But uh, these are the things we're going to give to you, the LEDs, the resistors, the wires, the, the little temp sensor. Now, this is not waterproofed, uh, and, and I've gotten some questions about that tonight. You know, you know we're not here to, to tell you all the, all the details on how to build it, but, but uh, we're, we're taking you as far as we think is, is um, uh, enough to get you started and get your students comfortable with experimenting. Um, and so we'll, if need be, if you guys are, are struggling once you get this material and you, you need some help, we'll get on the phone with you. All right, we'll, we'll schedule a phone call. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to your team. Um, like I said, you know, we'll, we're, not, we're trying to be careful not to give away any, any quote unquote answers, but we'll certainly push your students to some of the right resources and places that they can find the answers out for themselves. And what I love about what Mike described and what Fred described earlier is it, it's not just about detector building. I know it is for the competition and you guys are here for that, but they're gonna learn so much more um, because they're gonna go through this process of learning how to code. They're gonna learn how to build a sensor from scratch practically. And then they're gonna learn how to calibrate it. Uh, so there's a lot of deep learning that's gonna happen here that's gonna open up new worlds to them to make them realize that, hey, you know what, this is something that I can do. I can, I can uh, program. So that's the part of this whole thing that I'm most excited about. And uh, like I said, we want to help everybody uh, that, that asks for it. So please take advantage of, of what we're offering to you here. Uh, Fred, Mike, I'm kind of ranting a little bit. I don't mean to be. Um, I, want to, I want to emphasize something you said, too. Um, my kids thought this was an easy project when I started doing it. The first 10 probes they built looked really good, and the first 10 probes, all 10 failed. When we went into certain water conditions, they had not thought it through enough. Uh, then I had kids who thought, well, I'll make this thing super waterproof, and they made a probe and sealed it in such a way that it took over five minutes before it could read a temperature, because it just was basically sealed inside of a, a large container that took forever for the temperature to adjust. And, and during the competition, you got two minutes per station to give a temperature. So the engineering part of this and the, and the research the kids had to do to come up with a probe that wouldn't fail and was responsive and would give accurate values, uh, the, the whole concept of the math integration, a lot of STEM projects, um, the math to me was questionable whether it really is there. This one is, is rich. The math is there. They get to see the application of it. And the coding is great. The kids enjoy it. And it, it's just a, uh, it's been a great experience for my kids. 
Thanks, Mike. And then uh, also I wanted to um, see if uh, we've gotten a couple of questions about uh, other microcontroller devices such as Arduino uh, and, and Raspberry Pi. Fred, can you can you speak to those a little bit? Sure. The um, Arduino is a uh, device that um, can be programmed from a computer using um, a kind of a, a C language, which is a difficult language to kind of get started with if it's your first try. Um, it also has it has a analog to, a 10 bit analog to digital converter built in. Uh, which means that it can uh, measure analog input. It can measure that voltage that's coming off of your probe uh, to uh, 10 bits, which that's kind of a, a number that helps to describe the, the um, resolution of the, the measurement. Um, the uh, Raspberry Pi is a, another device that uh, can be used. Raspberry Pi typically uh, is, is also programmed with a computer, and uh, you can program it in Python, uh, which is a nice language to use. And um, the, the one drawback of that is it does not have an analog to digital converter on the microcontroller. Uh, and so the, uh, someone wanting to use that device would be required to uh, assemble a breadboard using a, um, a, 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 an analog to digital converter chip. And uh, there's, there's, quite a, there's been a lot of, of uh, discussion of some of these uh, points in the FAQ. So I encourage you to go to the Science Olympiad website and look at the FAQ on some of the rules around uh, some of the things that we're talking about here. Uh, but the, 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 the Raspberry Pi can be used uh, as long as a uh, external AD, uh, analog to digital converter is, is assembled on a breadboard. Um, the um, TI Innovator uh, also is a microcontroller that has um, uh, been kind of ruggedized, so to speak, for the classroom where the um, electrical inputs have been kind of uh, hardened so that you don't have to worry about shorting them out um, as you tinker around and try to, you know, do this. It's also in a, a case that um, is, is pretty well waterproof. That kind of helps too. It is programmed in uh, TI Basic, which is a kind of an easy entry language. Um, and um, that uh, language is accessed actually just right off the calculator. And then the innovator is plugged into the calculator. And when the program is run on the calculator, it actually talks to the innovator and it'll do that analog input. It'll do that analog to digital conversion for you. And uh, the TI innovator actually has a 14-bit uh, a um, analog to digital converter. So it's it has a, a, a nice high resolution uh, analog to digital converter because the, um, the actual, the heart and soul of the innovator is something called an MSP 432 launch pad, which is a, a board that is used by engineers when they're interested in developing a new product that has, in this case, uh, a Texas Instruments MSP microcontroller inside of the the product, whether it's a autonomous car or a microwave oven or or, or what have you, um, the launch pad is this design reference board. So, so it had that the chip is a very sophisticated chip in there, uh, has a lot of the electronic uh, components that are needed for this competition, and uh, it's they're all accessed in, in an easy to use interface uh, that is TI based on on the calculator. Uh, so. So that's a, kind of a rundown on the microcontrollers. So uh, all three um, are fair. In fact, there's other microcontrollers out there besides the three that are mentioned. Uh, there's actually getting to be quite a proliferation of these. And, and actually, for the most part, they're all legal to use with the rule that you cannot attach any sort of 
prefabricated signal processing board to the microcontroller. So you've got to use the microcontroller you choose, uh, and then any sort of sophisticated circuits that ride on top of that microcontroller have to be hand-built by the student. They cannot be uh, purchased. And, and again, the spirit of that rule is that we want the students to um, have an experience of doing this themselves. It's not about you know, buying uh, the, the fanciest equipment and using that. Uh, similarly, um, you know, we have tried to uh, make it so that students cannot download libraries off of the internet to incorporate into their software that hide, so to speak, a lot of the calibration and, and a lot of the software needed to make sense of the electrical signal coming into the microcontroller. Again, the spirit of the competition is for students to learn how to do that themselves. Uh, and so um, that's why uh, using uh, pre-authored libraries and pre-assembled hardware uh, boards is kind of uh, discouraged and is, is against the rules as you read the rules carefully and check out the Frequently Asked Questions board on the Science Olympiad website. So um, does that kind of give you an overview of that, Eric? Yeah, thank you, Fred. I, I wanted to, um, I just wanted to add add something uh, to, to what you were, uh, what you're just talking about. And so, um, you know, this is a TI webinar, so I want, I want to sing the praises of, of the TI solution, because uh, like you said, Fred, there are other ways to do it, and that's fine. And if your students are comfortable with Arduino, they're comfortable with Raspberry Pi, you know, we're, we're not trying to change that. But I do want to just highlight a couple of uh, hardware advantages of the hub, in addition to what Fred said, that the hub has a 14-bit ADC, uh, ADC uh, analog to digital converter. But it also has um, some other things that have been built more for the heavy use of a classroom. And so you'll notice that the hub is put in a plastic casing uh, just to kind of protect it a little bit. It also has some electrostatic discharge protection. So in, in a low humidity environment on some of these boards, um, if you're holding the board and you're kind of dragging your feet across the floor, uh, it, it is possible to generate um, an electrostatic charge. And uh, once that charge discharges into your board, it is possible that the chip on that board can go, um, can go away, can get, can get fried. And then when that happens, uh, that board's no longer useful. You, you just might as well throw it away. And so the TI Innovator Hub has been built with that in mind, knowing that kids don't always, you know, know these kinds of things. And so we built some protection to avoid that. Uh, there's also some uh, protection uh, circuitry in there that uh, if the kid puts the wire in the wrong hole uh, and there's power and it, the power is going the wrong direction, um, it's not a guarantee, but we've got some thermal uh, cutoff switches in there that will will uh, render the the hub useless until things cool down again. But you sh you should be able to use it again after that happens. So we we put some things in there that that make it a little more classroom durable. Um, I've gotten some questions about cost differences between the hub and, and some of these other solutions. And the hub is not the cheapest solution. It's not the most expensive either. But uh, the reason is, is because we, we, we know that these are used in, in classroom environments. Uh, and so we try to keep that in mind, which unfortunately does add a little bit of cost to it. In addition to the protection piece, there's also a built-in speaker, a built-in brightness sensor. Uh, there's a built-in onboard uh, RGB LED. You can't use that for detector building, but it's kind of neat that you, there's some other projects that you can do with it beyond Science Olympiad. And I think before we end tonight, I want to talk a little bit about those um, because uh, there's a lot of great stuff that TI is making and, and making available to you guys to try it uh, for free. Uh, Fred, in, in the chat window, you wanted me to blow this window up. Did, did I already miss that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, that looks good, uh, Eric. That's, I just wanted folks to be able to kind of see uh, everything that is in a complete solution. Uh, so you can see the uh, temperature sensor there. You can see the three LEDs. Uh, you can see the calculator with the display uh, because uh, you do need a display of temperature in the competition. 
Uh, and so there it shows the temperature. Uh, and then it also is helping you to know which color LED is on in case you had a, a, a wiring problem. So that, that's pretty much what I wanted folks to see. Now, of course, that's not a waterproof sensor there. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that sensor, the, little, the three little pins coming off that sensor are plugged into uh, some jumper wires. But yeah, I mean, before you would dip this in water, you'd have to protect it. And I think Mike Smith gave some, some, uh, some, some good uh, anecdotes um, in terms of his experience and the students' experiences. Uh, there have been some questions in the chat area, too, about how to waterproof it. You know, and again, uh, uh, you know, I try to drop some hints here because there's probably 100 different ways to do it. And I don't want to I don't want to dictate one way. But if you take a little trip to the hardware store and maybe talk to one of those uh, semi-retired fellows that walk around the store uh, all the time, they might be able to point you in the right direction uh, on some materials that are available to you that that will get the job done. You got to find that balance point of protecting the sensor but not protecting it so much that the, it, it's so insulated that the temperature changes take way too long uh, to happen. So that's gonna require some experimentation. And one, of, one of the things that you guys have both talked about, I wanna come back to it, is the fact that the, the sensor, and it's in the rules, has some real uh, specific requirements as far as the length and the size of the sensor. And that's because of the competition, how we're actually testing it. So that center, that center has to be a minimum of 30 centimeters long because the sensor is going to be placed into a, a insulated water container like a, a, a cup. And these cups will have different temperatures. Well, it's got to be able to reach it. I, I've had kids come in with a sensor that was mounted on the breadboard itself, and it was only a few centimeters long. We couldn't get it in the cup. Also, I've had kids who came in with their whole device thinking that the whole device was going to go in the water, not just the sensor. So they come in with these top on or these tubs that uh, it would take a swimming pool for me to actually be able to put them in the water. So make sure that they read the rules, they understand that it's you know 30 centimeters long, five centimeters max in diameter, uh, that it is waterproof, that it can handle the full range that water could be taken from from freezing water up to uh, the boiling point. Uh, um, as far as what you've said about the innovator itself, I've now used it. This is probably my third year that I've used them with eighth graders, and they're all still working. So they are very durable, and I'll guarantee my eighth graders would have broken if they could have. Um, so there is a lot of advantage to this device, and we're going to be using it again on next year's competition. The sensor will change, but the microprocessor will still be capable of doing all the things that we'll be asking it to do next year. So um, just wanted to kind of jump on top of some of the points you made. Awesome. Senior? Yeah, yeah Fred? Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you're good, go ahead. Well, I was just wondering um, with that, in that picture that you have there, uh, it looks like that's kind of assembled with wire. Uh, now, do you have to strip those wires to put them into the breadboard, or how does that work? Uh, well, it, uh, so it depends. So with the detector building kit and the, um, which, which by the way is a is a subset of TI's breadboard pack. So TI uh, sells, you know, obviously the calculators, the TI Innovator Hub. We also have this uh, this thing called the TI breadboard pack, and uh, you can find that on our website. I, if I if I have time, I'll show it to you. But what we did is we took some of the components from that. We we um, built, uh, we took the breadboard, some resistors, the LEDs, and we made a little subset called, that we're calling the detector building kit. Now you can't purchase a detector building kit. They're, they're not for sale. Um, but like I said, if you fill out the form at www.tidetectorbuilding.com, you fill that form out and request one, uh, while supplies last, I'll just send you one for free. But Fred, to answer your question, uh, for this, for these wires, no, uh, we didn't have to uh, strip those wires at all. Those are jumper wires, and they come with, uh, uh, well, there's two flavors. There's uh, male to female. Um, so at the bottom of the screen that you're seeing right here, the little temperature, analog temperature sensor is plugged into the female end of these jumper wires. And they're nice because they have these little black plastic uh, pieces. And so 
um, there's a spring-loaded little mechanism inside here. So when you plug that in, it kind of holds the temperature sensor in place, which is really nice. Uh, the mail ends plug into the breadboard port, which you can't really see it directly, but you can kind of get the idea. There's there's a row of uh, little ports on the on the end of the TI Innovator Hub. And then the other mail ends plug directly into the breadboard. These jumper wires just make life a little easier. Um, now you can take uh, wire, insulated wire, and you can cut it and you can strip the ends uh, and, and do all that kind of thing. But um, you know, this just kind of makes the process a lot easier. You don't need wire strippers and cutters and all that stuff. Uh, you can just use these jumper wires instead, male to male and male to female. Both of these come in the uh, TI breadboard pack as well as the TI detector building kit. So we'll, like I said, we'll send you these. Now the breadboard pack doesn't have the extra long male to female like Mike was mentioning. Uh, so you will need to get that separately. And if you need help finding those, uh, just email me, um, earcher at ti.com. Um, or you can just email the STEM team, stem-team at ti.com, and I'll post those emails here in a second. And I, I can point you in the right direction, but for the most part, um, uh, uh, this is the way to go. Now, the other piece uh, Fred just asked if um, prompted me to, to tell you, the TI breadboard pack gives you two options for a temp sensor. Either the temperature sensor here, and for, for, for beginners, actually for anybody, this is an easier path in my opinion because the calibration for this is linear. Uh, the, the students can probably very quickly modify their calibration equation, um, you know, because it's basically an MX plus B uh, with the analog temp sensor. But the TI breadboard pack also comes with a thermistor uh, if you want to do it uh, that way. The thermistor requires a little more, um, I mean, it's a, it's a nonlinear uh, uh, calibration, so it requires students to know a little bit more in terms of, uh, well, think about it this way. Your students are in the competition. Uh, they're on the spot. Time's ticking. They're given a, a temperature sensor to, to calibrate against. And so they need to go into their code and very quickly calibrate against a, a, uh, a temperature sensor that the event supervisor gives you. What position are you going to want them to be in? Are you going to want them to, to be able to find that quickly and, and be able to uh, change the numbers quickly? Or are you going to want them to have to deal with, with something a little more complex? You know, that, that's kind of what it boils down to, in my opinion. So, but the breadboard pack gives you both options. You can either use it this one or you can use a thermistor. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to go over here? We're about 10 minutes left. I want to jump real quick into the chat window. I know some people have been um, asking questions, and I apologize. I haven't, haven't gotten back to you. Hey, Fred or Mike, I want you guys to take this one. The question is, how do we account for the variability in the digital calibration thermometer? I assume they're talking about the one that the kids would uh, calibrate against. Yeah. So, I, I, Eric, I think that that kind of gets at part of the heart of the competition is that, you know, there's different ways uh, to deal with that in software. And uh, I think that, you know, we'll see clever ways uh, pop up. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a good question. And I encourage them to find a good solution. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's just it. And, and what's really what I love about this competition is um, when they get to the state and the national level, uh, the event supervisor is going to be the person that hands them an unknown uh, off the shelf kind of thermometer that they have to calibrate against. And so knowing how to modify their code, knowing their code backwards and forwards and knowing, you know, kind of what to change um, is going to be useful for them. And so they, they you know, practicing these things is, is, is really important. The other point I want to make very quickly is um, Mike was talking a little bit earlier about uh, his students going through 10 different temperature sensors. So look, I'm going to send you guys, if when you ask, I'm going to send you guys a uh, detector building kit. It comes with one analog temperature sensor. <laughs> Uh, now, I'm, I'm not a salesperson. Nobody on this phone call is a salesperson. We're all either current teachers or former teachers. 
but I would recommend you take a look at um, maybe getting a few, um, a few, at least a few uh, TI analog temperature sensors. And like I said, if you need help with that, um, let one of us know. Let me jump back over here to Q&A. Uh, I got a question here. Can a code be programmed to ask for the temperature of reference water samples and automatically calculate the slope and intercept, or do we have to do this manually? No, um, you, you can, if you're clever enough to anticipate what the program is going to be asking you to do, and you've got it built in your code to do that, go for it. Um, I, I've written several codes that my kids have played with where they've come up with strategies around the variations in a quick way to get a calibration curve refigured, but it's all been written by the student, and the student has come up with a strategy to do it, and as long as we can see that that's in the code, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging that creativity. Uh, is any of that information caught, or should it be caught, in the student's logbook? Mike or Fred? Can you repeat that again? Uh, the, the students are required to have a, a logbook, if I'm not mistaken. Would, right. would something like that need to be captured in the logbook? Well, it's required that they have at least the uh, raw data from a minimum of 10 runs. They'll then be putting it into some type of scatter graph showing patterns, and then some type of mathematical modeling where you overlay your equation on top of your data showing that the uh, equation that you're using is actually the one that explains the data. And then that needs to be documented in the code. It's actually told that you have to highlight that aspect of the code showing where that, that conversion, that equation is utilized. Awesome. And that, that, uh, there was another question about that too. Should we document our research along with our data in the required journal? And I think the answer to that is yes. And you also, that, that research is going to help you on the written test. So as you understand more about the, the event, uh, the components of the event, you're going to have more information for you to handle on the test questions. Um, another question here while we have time. I have some thermistors that I bought. They don't have any pre-programming, but they are already waterproof. Where can I check if these are allowed? Um, I'll tell you right away they're not. Yeah. <laughs> They're waterproof. You've already, uh, yeah, it's already disqualified. But again, check the FAQ. I think there's some pictures on there and there's some descriptions and that sort of thing on there. Yeah. Uh, another question here. How do I, how do we count? Oh, no, we already asked that one. Sorry. Uh, let's see. How would you use a potential, uh, sorry, how would you use a potentiometer in a potential design? Well, that, that kind of gets at, um, the flip side of the other question, which was a clever piece of software, this is more of a clever piece of hardware. So one could add a potentiometer to the breadboard and use that potentiometer to create some sort of electrical offset that could be useful in the design of all of this. But again, uh, that's up to the student to figure out how to do. I guess what I would say is that uh, a potentiometer is legal to use in a circuit that's student built on the breadboard that somehow interacts with the temperature sensing unit to help, you know, do whatever you're wanting to do, calibrate or offset or whatever it is. But how you would go about doing that is a really good question, and I encourage you to come up with an excellent solution. Uh, another question. Uh, I'm going to take this one, guys. So what's the best microcontroller to use? <laughs> uh, TI Innovator Hub by far. Okay. All right. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. And then uh, let's see, we got another one. So these projects will be helpful for my students gaining the skill to learn to build the detector. Uh, are they TI calculator specific or could they work with an Arduino? Uh, we do not have any Inspires at our school, but we do have an Arduino. So uh, you, can, you can do these projects. Now, the, the the instructions as far as the coding and stuff is not going to work for the Arduino, uh, but the basic components are going to work. Yeah, the uh, the the components will work. I mean, a, a resistor is a resistor. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you're doing some breadboardy kinds of projects, um, you can hook those up to an Arduino, Raspberry Pi, or uh, yeah, another hub. Uh, those those aren't really um, platform specific. Uh, if you don't have TI calculators uh, at your school, like I said, you know, we can loan those to you. Um, the loan's good for up to a month. It, uh, you know, on some exception, I can make some exceptions depending on on what my supply is like. Uh, to give you a two-week extension, but what I'll do in the meantime, while you have those calculators, I'll do everything in my power to help you find your own calculators, meaning most schools in the country have TI graphing calculators, and most students, at least in, in upper middle school and high school, are probably using a TI-84 Plus CE or a TI Inspire CX, and so from some of the folks I've already been working with, um, we have discovered uh, in almost all cases that their students have a TI-84 plus CE or a, or a Inspire CX. And those students are more than welcome to use their calculators. And then next question, because we got about two minutes left. From what I gather, a thermistor purchased from Amazon can be used for inputs. And I believe the answer to that question is yes, it can be, as long as it's not pre-waterproofed. Is that right, guys? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Fred already uh, mentioned on the Science Olympia website, if you go there, there is a list of, uh, it's not extensive for everyone, but there has a lot of the legal and illegal sensors that you can use, and many of those are the Amazon type that are already in waterproof housing, so you can go there to get a, a better feel for what's allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's asking, I have a TI-84 Plus from about 2008 or so, that's not going to be good enough for this event, is it? Uh, unfortunately, the only TI graphing calculators that will work with the hub uh, are the TI-84 Plus CE, and like I said, ask your, your students, chances are one of them has one, or the TI Innovator, uh, TI Inspire CX or CX2, uh, a new version of the Inspire just released earlier this year, either will work. Um, and like I said, if you don't have access, uh, just fill out the form at tidetectivebuilding.com, and I will get to you um, uh, to use while you're waiting for, uh, you know, uh, while you're trying to figure out how to get your own. Uh, how do we sign up for the free kit? Uh, TIDetectorBuilding.com, click the Get Started button and uh, fill out the form. And then another question, so the TILM19 is a sensor that comes with a free kit, right? If so, we just need to calibrate it and waterproof it. Um, that is correct. So uh, once you get the kit, that's that little sensor is in the kit. And yeah, you would just need to build the sensor, um, code it, calibrate it, test it, waterproof it, and all that gets waterproof it, then test it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, we, we try. Don't, don't 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 forget about the other half of the LED display. Oh, and, and yeah, the breadboard in the little picture you can see the breadboard comes with the three LEDs: the red, the green, and the blue. I will say some of the kits I've built recently have a clear LED, but it's actually red. Um, so if you guys get one with a clear LED, it's, it's really red, and, and that's fine. They can use that. Uh, let's see. I think I've answered almost everything. Can the code be programmed to ask? We already did that one. Let's see. Make sure I got everybody's questions answered. Sorry if I didn't. Uh, you're welcome to email us um, because we are out of time. Uh, let's see. So for the calibration, can we use the built-in linear regression function? I don't know what they mean by built-in. Do you guys? If, if he's talking about the one that they use the calculator to determine the regression on a calculator based on data they collected, yeah, I would. Okay. And then someone has a Raspberry Pi. Uh, I think they just need clarification. They're asking about the um, because it doesn't have a, a, a built-in ADC chip. Uh, it doesn't have an ADC on its chip, rather. Um, they're saying that it's okay that they would use it on a separate board. And the answer to that is. Yeah, but it has to be student built. It can't be something that the students buy online and then just attach it to the Raspberry Pi. It has to be something that they would, uh, the students would have to build on their own. Again, check the FAQs. That's very clearly covered. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody's questions, but um, uh, you are welcome to email us. And I'm going to put this in the Q&A window. Uh, so you can email us at STEM dash team at ti.com uh, and I, hopefully you guys can see that hopefully although I don't see where it is 
uh, and I'll just repeat it a couple times. There it is, stem-team at ti.com. Uh, just email me at that address, and Fred and I uh, will get back to you um, with answers to your questions. Now, keep in mind, if you're asking us questions that, that are, are kind of giving away the farm, we're not going to give you direct answers. Um, but if you're asking for how do I do this or, or what do I need to learn to do this, we'll definitely help you out. We'll get you, we'll get you squared away, get you the information you need. Okay. Well, Fred and Mike, I want to say thanks to you uh, both for, for um, um, providing this information to the participants. Uh, like I mentioned before, this webinar will be captured on YouTube. And uh, a, a post, those of you that registered, you'll get an email um, in a day or two, uh, just saying, uh, here's the link to go to to uh, find this webinar. Um, and I'll make sure that they add our email address in that email that we send to you as well. Okay. All right, Mike, Fred, anything else? Uh, I don't think so. Good luck, everybody, and have fun with Science Olympiad. Same here. All right. All right, uh, guys, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Eric Archer. Uh, I'm a TI employee. Fred Poach uh, is also a TI employee, and Mike Smith uh, is a veteran teacher. Uh, somebody was asking who we are, <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to make sure um, I answered that question. Okay, all right, bye, everybody. Good luck this year. <laughs>